Hello and welcome to episode six of the Cars.coza podcast. My name is Chiro Desiena and I am delighted to be joined in our little studio by Neil Hill, the managing director of Ford Motor Company Southern Africa. Hello, Neil. Chiro, wonderful to be here. Thanks for the opportunity and um, yeah, brought a little bit of rain with me to Cape Town, but um, <laughs> I'm sure you guys will welcome it. No, you know what? After day zero fear of 2018, so Cape Townians love some rain. We we, we never complained, really. Yeah, <laughs> no, the really good to see. Yeah, the, the alternative was worse. It was funny. I just spent four days in Derbs. It rained continuously. Went to Joburg. It rained almost continuously. Came back here, listening to the radio. Oh, there's a cold front till Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've established you the common connection. Yeah, no, it's apparently my fault, this whole thing. But anyway, so yeah, welcome to our little studio, Neil. I've actually, I've brought in um, some paraphernalia to hopefully make you comfortable. Yeah, um, thank that you. Is a, that's a bullet model over there. Uh, we'll, we've got a lovely little Mustang Hot Wheels over here. And then also what I did was I rearranged this artwork here because the, the Mustang wasn't behind me. So we, we had the Alpha. So I thought that that had to go, you know. <laughs> no, well, I really appreciate the atten attention to DJ. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, so by, by way of introduction, um, Neil is, uh, is pretty much um, running things now at, at Ford. And Ford is, Ford is in a really interesting place. Huge investment going into South Africa, which, of course, I think is fantastic for the country. Um, it really is. I think as any South African will appreciate big investment coming into the country. So that's great. Um, and obviously, being on the journalism side of things, we've had a long association with Ford at Cars.coza. So it's wonderful to, to chat to you about a couple of things. And I think let's start with... Um, the Ford customer experience model. So at the Cars of Cosa Consumer Awards, we have a consumer survey. And from what we've seen in the data, um, Ford wasn't performing particularly well for a long time. Not badly, yep. but not particularly well. And we've seen an uptick in the data because our consumer survey runs all the time. And is that has that been a concerted effort from Ford's side? So, Chira, that's very definitely been a concerted effort. I mean, we realized, and this is going back quite a number of years now, that we looked at it and we felt that that was probably the one area of our brand experience that customers were not um, you know, really getting the full benefit of everything that we could do to make their ownership experience um, a delightful, enjoyable one. So we really put a lot of effort and a lot of emphasis into our consumer experience in terms of how customers interact with the brand, how we treat our customers and what we do to look after them. So we've, you know, over the last couple of years, we, we actually went down the, the route of creating a specific department um, as part of a restructuring that we did back in about the beginning of 2018 that we established a consumer uh, experience department to look specifically at the way that our customers interact with the brand, our systems, our processes, both internally and within our dealer network. You know, at the end of the day, customers don't see Ford and the dealer network as two separate entities, it's the Ford brand. So we've really worked very hard at building this model that um, is designed at looking after our customers and treating them as though they are part of our family. And you know, if you listen to Jim Farley, our new CEO talking, you know, he talks all the time about customers as being part of the family and the global consumer experience department is actually headed up by Elena Ford, who is um, the great, great granddaughter of Henry Ford. Wow. So, you know, and, and that's her passion. You know, when you think about it, she could choose any department in the company to work in. She chose and still continues to head up our, con our global consumer experience department. That's a really lovely story. And, and uh, <coughs> Ranger obviously is, is, if I'm not mistaken, your biggest sales driver. Correct. Uh, in South Africa, at least. And uh, has there been a, a concerted effort around managing Ranger customers? Yeah, we've very definitely looked at that. So, you know, when we looked at the whole consumer experience um, setup, what we wanted to do was make sure that our Ranger customers also got, um, and, I, and I don't want to call it special treatment, but we focused on Ranger because it's 60% of our sales. It's a, built, it's a vehicle that we build in South Africa, incredibly proud of it, exported to the world. But you know, when you buy a Ranger, you either buy it for work purposes or you buy it for leisure purposes, but the whole intent of the vehicle is that it's got to be there to serve you. It does no good being parked in a dealership's garage or parked on the side of the road. It actually needs to be doing what you bought it for. So we created actually a Ranger support team. So in the event of something happening, we've got a team of people who step into action and it starts with the fact that from the moment you give us a call through our roadside assistance, which is served by the AA, 
Um, it starts from that particular point. So we get a trigger, we get a notification that something's happened. We offer you security services to stand by you on the side of the road if you feel unsafe. The vehicle gets picked up, it gets into a dealership. A case manager is actually appointed to the vehicle or to your particular issue. And then that case manager will be the person who liaises with the customer on a continuous basis. Behind the scenes, we have um, our technical team, so the service engineering team kick in, understanding what's happened with the vehicle, how do we get it fixed. The parts team on standby to make sure that we've actually got all the parts that we need with the intention of actually getting that vehicle back on the road in the shortest possible time that we possibly can. So, you know, behind the scenes, huge amount of people kicking into, into action. At the end of the day, it's about that customer and how quickly we can get them back into their vehicle. And, yeah. and that's really the focus of what we're doing in, in just in that little, that particular element of it. Because, I mean, the reality is that there's, there's a couple of elements when people are deciding to buy a car. There's the quality of the product, um, mm -hmm. how, appe how appealing they find the product. But obviously a massive component is is after sales service. So does does Ford as an as an OEM work very, very closely with, with dealers across the country in, in terms of say training or how to manage relationships with, with customers on a sort of very granular level or how, how sort of deep into the dealerships does Ford go? So we go, I. <laughs> I think the dealers will tell you that we probably go too far. <laughs> but, but, you know, really it's a partnership. Our dealers are a partnership, mm -hmm. you know, are our partners. And the way we look at it is that their success is our success, our success is their success. So we look at it on that basis in terms of we we willing to step in and help. So technical training is an example. We have a very, very detailed curriculum. We've just opened a brand new training facility in Silverton that we, we've upgraded. It is now state of the art in terms of what the model dealership workshop should actually look like. So all of the special tools, everything of that nature, we bring our technicians in there on a regular basis. Um, so we conduct detailed technical training. In addition to that, we've got a training academy, which is the Ford Academy, which has been running for over the last 20 years, where we provide um, the soft skills. So that's the, you know, the, the kind of insights that we give to our frontline staff, your service advisor. How should you be, how should you treat a customer when they come in? You know, all of those are the different elements that we look at it. So we look at it as a holistic ecosystem mm -hmm. of being there to support. You know, we support our parts um, department. I mean, we do deliveries on a daily basis to majority of our metro dealers. Um, and sometimes we're actually delivering parts to those dealerships twice a day. So there's a sure. massive infrastructure that is designed mm -hmm. at supporting the dealer network and, and ultimately to support our customers. Cars at Coza, I mean, our, our bread and butter is, is used cars. Um, of course, Bucky's flow through our site like you won't believe. Um, to to arrange a buyer who's perhaps buying out of warranty, mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of the time I do a, I do a segment on Cape Talk Radio, a live Q and A segment. A lot of time people ask me which which cars are made in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Is there is there an effect on parts pricing if the vehicles are built here? Does it give the manufacturer a competitive edge? Well. You know, so I think one of the first things is that when you mm. look at South Africa's production setup, mm. um, all your big players, you know, ourselves um, with the Ranger, our Suzu with the with the D Max, you know, Nissan with the Navara, Toyota with the Hilux, you know, you run through those; those are all locally assembled. Part of the um, APDP or the Automotive Development Plan that we work on in conjunction with the government is aimed at driving local content, mm. and you know, we all are measured to get to a minimum of forty percent. Um, local content, and then when you start moving into um, the SAM, which is the South African Automotive Master Plan 2035, that's got to grow to 30 to 60%. So that drives a lot of localization, and and that's a really key important element. And it was borne out recently in the um, 2020 AA Kingsley report, um, which came out and did an assessment on the use you know, the parts or basket of parts pricing. We're very pleased to say Ranger performed the best in its segment in oh, terms fantastic. of the pickup segment, and in particular on our two-liter single turbo XLT, mm. um, which you know also won the 2019 West Bank Fuel Economy Challenge as the South Africa's most fuel efficient bucky. Okay, um, so that's, that's starting, important. So you're starting to see a bit of a story, you know, developing here. So mm. cost of ownership is very important. So our two-liter mm. single turbo, which is manufactured at our engine plant in Port Elizabeth. Um, most fuel efficient vehicle then you add to that the, the most cost effective vehicle from a basket of parts pricing in comparison to all the other manufacturers mm. so cost of ownership is a massive um, element that we look at mm. 
you know, and, and I think it's important also to remind customers, you know, you, your listeners as well, the fact that all of our vehicles come standard with the six year, 90,000 kilometer service plan. So that covers your service, covers your service for that, for those periods. And there's also a four year, 120,000 K warranty. And that can be extended um, six, eight years if, you know, if you want to go that through our own internal Ford Protect department, which does extended warranties. Mm upgrade service plans to maintenance plans. So there's a whole host of different things that we can do to help customers and make vehicles more efficient or more cost-effective to own. You mentioned um, some of the the government's private-public partnerships. Mm. And you know, government in South Africa gets a pretty bad rep, generally. Um, And I imagine you might have to put your best diplomatic hat on here. But, you know, you guys are important. You know, you're big employers. Like you say, you're driving major parts um, sourcing in South Africa and parts development in South Africa. That, of course, grows local business. Um, what's it like working with, with government in the motor sector? Uh, I must say we, we've had a very good relationship. And I'm talking, let's start talking at an industry level first and foremost. So NAMS a very organized um, industry representative body. And, you know, we've, we've really set up um, or set out to make NAMSA the voice of the automotive industry. So we've been cooperating very closely with people like uh, NARCAM, which is the uh, Component Manufacturing Association, with NADA, which is the dealer representation. Um, And we've got a very good relationship with the Department of Trade, Industry and Commerce. And, you know, we we speak to them on a regular basis. I mean, last week we were were, having a virtual meeting with Minister Patel, Mm. uh, talking through specific uh, elements of the automotive industry, some of the key building blocks and pillars that we're working on for Psalm 2035. And, you know... I go and have a look at the relationship that we've been able to foster as Ford Motor Company, and you know we we are in the process right now of developing, or in conjunction with the with the government and all three tiers of government, both you know national, provincial, and local government in the city of Chwani, a 4.3 billion rand uh, special economic zone right next to our Silverton assembly operation, and that's yep. a massive expansion. So, and that's 200 hectares that we're going to be putting you know under roof effectively bringing in suppliers that will be feeding into the Silverton manufacturing facility and creating in excess of 70,000 jobs in the area. That's fantastic. So, yeah. you know, and I was I, had, I was there week before, before last, you know, just walking around the plant with uh, Orchid Berry, who's the VP of manufacturing operations. Mm. And, you know, there was a time back when we used to talk about OR oh, Tambo being a construction site with an airport attached. <laughs> Right now, our <laughs> Silverton facility is a construction site with a manufacturing, a car manufacturing plant built, you know, attached to it. Is <laughs> such as the the magnitude of the work that's yeah. going on. But um, it is incredibly exciting to see what's happening there. I, I love that. Uh, as I said at the beginning of the podcast, I think major investment like that. Um, and and is that is that investment driven by Ford Global? I mean, where will the where will the vast majority of that money come from? That huge figure that you gave out. Yeah. So so the you know so if you go back and have a look at it, since 20, 2009 to two thousand and eighteen, we've invested over eleven billion rand um, just in in our facilities here, and you know there's a lot more investment that's going in. So the four point three billion that I mentioned there, that's government mm. who's put the infrastructure okay. in. Mm. Um, so we're working towards that, but. Those investment decisions are taken by Ford Motor Company Global. Um, you know, we compete uh, against other manufacturing facilities around the globe. So one of our biggest competitors, for example, is Thailand. Okay. So we go into a bidding war as to where investment and production is going to be based. This is so interesting to me because I think it's a huge misconception out there, uh, definitely amongst the public. And it's something I only learned a couple of years ago is that Plants don't just get given, you know, the next model to produce. You, you guys almost actually fight amongst each other, like you say, Ford SA with Ford Thailand, to produce the next Ranger or whatever it is. Oh, trust me, it's it's a bidding war, um, you know, because all of us want the prestige and, you know, the, the recognition that we've got a manufacturing facility in South Africa. You know, we're very fortunate. We're well positioned relative to Europe, which, which is one of our biggest customers that we export to. But, you know, we set up to export to over 150 countries globally. Um, we do, you know, our ranges that we build here in South Africa are exported. Currently, it's just over 100 countries given COVID and, and everything that's happening at the moment. But we do everything from left-hand drive to right-hand drive vehicles. We do stage two to stage six in terms of emission standards. 
um, and we do all three body styles. We do all the different series styles. So it's it's a very big deal for us to be exporting vehicles mm. and and selling them to the rest of the world. And you know, Europe being one of our biggest customers, especially with the European Free Trade Agreement that's in place. You know, Brexit could throw a spanner in the works, but we'll worry about that when that finally gets settled. <laughs> but you know, it, it's it's very much about us flying the South African flag, and mm. you know, th- there's you know for my for the team that build the vehicles and how they do it and the passion that they put into mm. it, it's a massive accolade to see those vehicles being loaded on ships and heading to to shores all over, and mm. you get back the reports that you know once again Rangers won another award in the UK. Um, it leads the pickup segment in the UK. It leads it in Germany, and that's all built proudly South African. Yeah, I mean, and manufacturing is is tough. That's some that is some seriously difficult work. I've been really lucky to visit a few a few plants, and the the level of organisation that goes into it just bends my mind. You know, because it's it's called just in time manufacturing. Hey, so you don't actually store a lot of the parts; they sort of arrive. As, as needs be. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, what, what makes it even more complicated is we don't batch build. And what I mean by batch build is we don't wake up on a Monday and say, okay, fine, Monday morning we're going to build all the white single cabs. <laughs> and then Tuesday we'll build all the red ones and then we'll build all the blue ones. So the li- our operators who work on that production line will build a wild track left-hand drive that's going to Germany. <laughs> the next vehicle that comes down the line will be a right-hand drive single cab that's going to Cameroon. Sure. And or whatever, you know, and, and that's how it flows. So the yeah. guys are continuously having to, you know, understand what vehicle's coming to them, mm. what they have to fit on that vehicle, because each one's got different specifications and different requirements. Mm. Um, and then the parts are just continuously being fed uh, to the line to match that particular approach as well. It's phenomenal. I, I, I really hope, I wish that every sort of petrol head out there, even if you aren't a petrol head, if you get the opportunity to go to a plant, you absolutely must go see cars being made. It's just the most incredible thing. Yeah. <laughs> I think if you want a real appreciation, yeah, actually work on the line. Yeah? Yeah. And you, you gave uh, some of our journals, I know my, my esteemed colleague Dave Taylor got to, got to work on the, on the line with you. <laughs> yeah, you got to build some engines for us. <laughs> uh, we apologize to the members of the public who received those. <laughs> Teasing you, Dave. Dave's behind the camera over there for our audience watching. <laughs> yeah, no, that, was, that was a fantastic day. I mean, yeah. just to have, you know, and, and, and I think the, the realization is the pressure that these people, that, that, our, that our people are under. Yeah. And, you know, you're doing that eight hours a day. That's tough stuff. Eh? It's tough. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a great appreciation. And, and whenever yeah. I get the chance to walk through the, the facility and spend time talking to, mm. to the operators, um, I've just got a, a massive appreciation for what they do mm. every day um, for Ford. I mean, uh, pre-COVID, I'm, I'd imagine you went to the U.S. a fair bit to, to view operations there. I mean, how would you say uh, a plant in South Africa differs to, say, a plant in the in the U.S.? Um, <clears throat> I'd say that, you know, when you look at it now, um, the gap is closing dramatically. Um, and that's really because we're taking opportunities to introduce new systems, new processes, upgrades and elements like that. Um, the, you know, depending on which type of facility you go to, if you go to, for example, F-150, an F-150 plant now in Michigan, um, it's a completely different environment because they're building all aluminium. So all of a sudden, that whole scenario of steel versus aluminium mm. fabrication is completely different. But the, the operating system that sits behind that is consistent across the world. So you can put an operator from South Africa into a facility in the US or uh, anywhere in the world, and they'll be able to pick up the operating process because we use standard, um, standard you know, work, mm. work instructions. And... There's, a, there's, you know, the, the, the measurement criteria is exactly the same. Um, so that's what we've been working incredibly on is, to, is mm. to make sure that we actually get to the point that our operating practices in South Africa are replicating what is being done in other parts of the world. Mm. And we also do that in terms of systems and equipment that we use. And the reason why we do that is that if we start picking up a fault or a, a concern on a vehicle, a quality concern on a vehicle in Thailand, because we're using exactly the same equipment, we're using the same processes, we can actually flag it to other plants that are building it. So mm. we can get an early alert. 
we don't need to let the customers find out for us and then feed it back to us. We can actually go, no, hold on, stop, stop the line, do this, we need to change that, we need to fix this, or segre- you know, park that vehicle to one side, let's make sure we understand what's going on. Wow. So that whole ecosystem of our plants across the world is becoming more and more integrated, yeah. and the data sharing across the platforms and, and the different manufacturing facilities is yeah. phenomenal. I um I have to ask you this. So there's a there's a dealership across the road from us here called the Toy Shop. They do some interesting things. Mm-hmm. And there's a an F one fifty Raptor sitting there mm-hmm. for sale. I mean, I I've been lucky to travel and, and see F one fifties on the road. When I was in the States, an F one fifty picked me up as an Uber. <laughs> which was which yep. was really cool. So will we ever see F one fifty on SA roads? So uh, no. I, 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 <laughs> well, there we go. Good chat. Thanks yeah. for watching. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, and, and you know, I think I think it's also about horses for courses. And and what, mm. what we've done is a, so South Africa forms part of what we term as the international market group. So IMG, as we term it, as an acronym in, in Ford, you know, in Ford speak. Um, if Ranger is our product. And what we're doing is that we're looking at every single possible way that we can absolutely mm. maximize and take the range of franchise, if we can call it that, into every possible space. I think a lot of people don't realize that range is actually 85% the size of an F-150. Mm. Um, and you know, by the time you start importing the vehicle, A, we've got to re-engineer it for left-hand drive, from left-hand drive to right-hand drive. Yes. So that in itself mm. is a very significant investment. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, Let's say never, never is a long time. So I'm never going to say that F-150 will never be available in South Africa, but mm. it's not in the foreseeable future, purely because the fact that, you know, we've got Ranger and we're going to maximize Ranger to its fullest extent. Yeah. Would we like to have F-150? We'd love to have F-150. Mm. But we've just got so much potential and scope with Ranger. Um, and we've got, a, we've got a lot of tricks up our sleeve, which... <laughs> We'll watch the space. We'll uh, let let that unfold <laughs> over time. Um, but you know, you know, Ranger certainly is mm. our product, and we're going to back it. And you know, the fact that we build it here and export it to the world, I think, is yeah. also something I'm incredibly proud of. And I mean, you you can see the effect that products like F one fifty Raptor have around the world because you know, obviously, these days things travel so fast on social media, and and I don't think I mean it's almost like a cult. I I don't think I've ever seen a standard looking ranger in Gauteng. I mean, it, th- there's so much love for the brand that, mm-hmm. that, and I mean, I'm sure it must drive you guys nuts in some ways, but in another way, I mean, it's great. You, you've got this like rabid love for the brand. People want to buy your car and they want to stick things to it so it looks like the coolest car in their minds in the whole world. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, I mean, so from a brand appeal, it's absolutely fantastic. And I mean, I think the fact that customers have got that passion for their product is mm-hmm. absolutely fantastic. It does... It does come with a double-edged sword, though. Sure. Um, you know, the the challenge that we do see from time to time is that people stick on aftermarket drawers that come from the Chinese fake shops. <laughs> the challenge with those, they have not been tested for cooling. Ah. So all of a sudden, now that you, you've put the, the FORD grill in the front of it, yeah, and you've reduced your airflow by 35%. Oh, right. Okay. In a hot market. In, in a, a hot, hot market. Climate, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Throw, throw high ambient temperature, high yeah. altitude, yeah. harsh driving conditions, high dust. You know, that's where we unfortunately start getting a little bit nervous because, you know, yeah. we engineer to a certain spec. Mm. Um, when you start moving outside of those parameters, it does start giving us a, a, a bit of a worry bead. So, mm. you know, people will turn around and say that we've probably been you know, I don't want to say, you know, we, we've, we've stressed the importance of sticking to original OE parts, you know, original equipment yeah. parts, because our vehicles are, def- are, are engineered to operate within a range. When you move outside of those ranges, then it does, it can start compromising, and especially over um, extended periods of time. Yeah. I, I was, you know, it's funny. Um, I bought my first car. It's actually sitting outside there because I've been doing this job since I was 19. Um, I wanted, I've never bought a car. So I wanted something quite special and, and I don't like modifying cars and I don't like convertibles. So I bought a supercharged Mazda MX-5 <laughs> from 1990. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I don't like modifying cars, it tends to break them. And I, and I think people underestimate 
how much testing it takes to get a new model on the road, how much money manufacturers spend on R&D to make sure that when you buy your car, it actually lasts for a bloody long time. And and then, you know, you, you, you get these kits, like you say, coming over from wherever, they've not just not been tested they basically just are aesthetically cool and uh, and then it wreaks all this all this havoc yep. you know so i'm i'm big on i mean we talk about this often as car journalists it's just like just buy a range and just leave it it's fine <laughs> It, look, it looks good. It's okay. And if you really want a cool Ranger, buy the Raptor because yeah. then it's all done for you. It's all been R&D'd properly. You yeah, know? And, and you know, when you start looking at a Raptor, for example, you know, people go, well, why is a Raptor yeah. cost over 800000 And, mm. you know, we were looking at the – so in the Kingsley report, they actually feature the Raptor as part of their basket of parts pricing together okay. with the XL T. The, you know, so people look at the Raptor price list and they go, holy hell, yeah. front shock absorbers cost 28,000 Rand. Mm versus 947 Rand for a standard shock. <laughs> but that's what makes a Raptor a Raptor, yes. is yeah. there is so much under the skin engineering that goes in there. You yeah. know, each corner, there's, you know, let's call it 30,000 Rands worth of suspension just on shock absorbers. Mm. But that gives you the ability to take a vehicle and thrash it over a salt pan at 160 kilometers an hour like yeah. you're driving on Santon's tarred roads. That, that is such a car, that. Uh, did you see our video where I ramped it in the Jeep? Yep. <laughs> it, was doing, was, it, it was doing what it was bred I mean, to do. Yeah. I mean, what there is nothing else you can buy in a showroom that you can do that in. There just isn't. It, yeah. You know, it, well, you, I mean, you can do it once. <laughs> <laughs> then you said it's stuffed. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a couple of dirt roads in the area where I stay, and yeah. everybody goes, you know, every now and again, I get somebody who goes, So, what's special about the Raptor? So I say, Okay, come. Yeah. And we go and play on the dirt roads. And what I normally do is I get into the passenger seat and I say, Okay, fine. Now, you're going to listen, and I'm going to tell you how to drive, but this is what you're going to do. Yeah. And people get out of the car and they go, Holy hell. Yeah. I did not expect that because. The vehicle is so it, it, it's engineered to such an extent and tested like you cannot believe to take that. Um, you know, we did the press launch up in Hudurapan, up near Uppington, mm. uh, for Raptors, and we had um, Gareth Woolridge, um, one of Neil Woolridge's sons, with us for the week. And you know, as normal, when I get up there, first thing he says, Neil, come, we're going for a drive. And mm. I know, okay, so I'm going to get the 12 out of 10 experience and <laughs> he's going to show me how good he is and explain to me why he needs this and, you know, how, how he can make the cars yeah. faster. But, you know, we thrashed it around. He drove me around and, you know, it was a controlled environment. And at the end of it, he turned around and said, this car, the Raptor in base form, was quicker than the Class D car they campaigned in the off-road racing series. Sheesh. As a, spe a specifically built cross-country racing car. Yeah, no, that, so that, that product is... Speaks volumes. I, I was really lucky. I went to Oz, I went to Darwin uh, <coughs> to the international launch. That was yeah. a lot of fun. I mean, uh, just quickly recount the story. So we went to, a, I mean, you know it, but for our listeners and, what, and viewers... We went to a cattle farm larger than Ireland mm -hmm. where, where Ford had basically just built this freaking off-road playground. And I got paired up with a, an Aussie equivalent of an Aussie NASCAR racer, basically. Rob. And I think it was the only car launch I've ever been on where I was told to absolutely thrash the bloody thing. <laughs> because normally you go on a car launch and the poor PRs go, please, can you show some mechanical sympathy for the vehicles? You know, That's normally how it goes because, shame, they want to take their cars home in one piece, right? <laughs> These bloody journalists come along. <laughs> now, wrap the launch, no, drive it like you stole yeah, it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the guy said to me, when in doubt, flat out. That was his... <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and you know I, I drive a raptor and i love it and yeah. to me it's just, is that your daily that's my daily a raptor a raptor oh, that's, yep. that's fantastic yeah i got a raptor in my garage and every day i walk out i get into i open the garage door get into uh, you know and there's uh, i get a smile on my face because you know i'm exceptionally lucky that that's what i get to drive as my daily driver that's cool that's yep. cool but difficult to park but <laughs> Why? You park it where you want. Oof, I know. Well, fair <laughs> enough. On anything you want, yeah. But in Cape Town, oh, it's so fun. Yeah. I get, I get a, a double cab back here as a test car, and I'm just like, oh, here we go. Because it doesn't yep. fit in my parking bay, at my flat, and it's just – anyway. So yeah. <laughs> they're not my favorite vehicles to live with. Yeah. The, but, the only thing yeah. is that every now and again I've got to hose the garage out because normally there's a, there's a, a, a ton of mud – that's dropped off the bottom of the car. <laughs> and my wife looks at me and she says, you got to clean your side of the garage again. Yeah, yeah. You can just see which side is yours when you reverse both cars out. Yeah, exactly. A huge puddle of mud. Yeah. So, so would you, I mean, would you consider yourself a petrolhead? 
I love cars. Yeah. It's, you know, growing up as a kid, um, my, you know, and look, I, I was born in 68, so I'm just mm-hmm. over 50. Um, the car that I aspired to was an Escort 1600 Sport. And it actually turned out that it was my first car that I owned. My, my parents very kindly sponsored um, a 1600 Sport as my first car. That's and, cool. And, um, you know, I... I just love cars. I love the I love the engagement with cars. And mm-hmm. I think that that's something that for me it's yes it's an expensive product that we sell, but the emotional connection that people have with cars is just of such a nature that it is um mm. you know it's a unique bond. And you know I consider myself exceptionally fortunate that a passion of my life is something that I do for a job. Yeah. I can I can I can really relate to that. Yeah. I think Excuse my ignorance here, but what is that? Is that that's an Escort Mark One? Ah, <laughs> yeah, that's the Mark One. So that's not that's not the one you. No, you I had, had the so the Mark Two yeah. was the one that had the slightly more raked back window. Okay, yeah, okay. also rear wheel drive, and that was. I mean, the Escort Mark Two was the one that they campaigned very famously in the you know in the in the World Rally Series. The, B, the you know BDA engines. Uh, Sorrel raced them for us when Sorrel was driving for yeah. Fords in the, the South African Rally Championships. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's, yeah. Okay. But the Escort Mark 1 also featured very prominently in our rally campaigns globally as well. Okay. I'm very glad I didn't pick that up and you didn't say, sure, that's a Mazda. <laughs> that would have gone pretty bad. Pretty <laughs> it could have gone pear-shaped. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, I mean, South Africans really do have a um, a love affair with Ford. I mean, my, my girlfriend's dad had an XR3. And uh, I bought her, so on our sentimental shop, um, Hannes managed to get an XR3, a, a 1243 model. Okay. Which, there's only a thousand of these things in the world. So I managed to get sure. one for her and I gave it to her birthday. And I mean, she just burst into tears. You know, I mean, that's how much the, you know, these cars mean to people. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And, so, you know, you go back and look at our heritage. I mean, mm. you go back, it's Escort Mark 1s, Mark 2s, mm. um, Cortinas, um, Granadas. And then, you know, there was also the special gift that we gave the world through Piranha. Yes. Um, we, we've got one. It's, it's, I believe uh, so. Yeah, yeah, it's busy being stripped to yeah. pieces. Yeah. Uh, so Basil Green, I mean, and, and if you get to talk to Basil, um, what a fascinating gentleman. Mm. I mean, I didn't know, and I've known Basil since I've started working for the company, uh, Basil's a Formula One engineer. Ah, wow, okay. So, you know, he was telling the story about how he actually got into becoming a Formula One engineer, but, um, you know, left South Africa, went and worked in Europe as an F1 engineer, um, and then ultimately came back and then decided to start building, uh, you know, finding a way to shoehorn a V8 into a car that was only designed to take a <laughs> 1.6 force in the engine. <laughs> and that's how the Piranha brand was built, yeah. uh, was born. I yeah. mean, so, you know, to give back to the world a classic Mm. like the Capri Piranha V8. Mm. Um, you know, it's just absolutely fantastic. I'm, I'm dying to drive that thing. You know, so so what happened with our sentimental collection was we, we built it up quite quickly because quite a few nice cars came along. Yep. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, the Ford was our final purchase. And then the guys who own cars at Coza said to Hannes, right, no more money. We've got five cars. <laughs> That's enough. We're not buying any more bloody cars. So <laughs> <laughs> and, then it, and then it took... Hannes, and, and then I think what happened was Hannes hid them all under his basement in Pineland somewhere where he lives. And then he just, you know, enjoyed them. And then it took about three years until the rest of us could drive one. So in the office now, we've got the 325, the Super yep. Boss, and, and I've got to drive all of those. But I absolutely cannot wait to drive that Piranha. It's, it's busy being paint off restorations. It's going to take a while. But yep. Yeah. But I hope I hope we can we can net, give it to you for a spin as well. Yeah, I'd, really. I'd love to. I, yeah. I mean, when you get to drive classics like that, and, yeah. you know, I, I go back and I, you know, I was fortunate enough to work. Um, you know, I was working for the company when we did the Sierra XR6s and the XR6i, which we fuel nice. injected the SXV6 engine. Um, the, XR, the Sierra XR8 was a little bit before my time. Okay. Um, but absolutely cl- another classic. That was um, the Mustang engine. Yeah, it was uh, a five yeah. liter five liter V eight that mm. they they put into the the XR eight mm. as well. I think we did two hundred and fifty of them, and mm. they we campaigned them in Group N. So that was the the heyday of Group N when it was 
BMW 535s or 335s. Uh, yes, Alpha GTs. Alpha yeah, GTV, yeah. Uh, GTV 3 liter uh, mm. uh, V6s. Mm. And then, of course, we had the Sierra XR, XR8 running at that stage as That's well. That's a lot of fun. Eh? There, there was uh, some good racing. It's actually so much fun to pull up that stuff on YouTube. We, we have filmed an XR8. I forget where the gentleman lived. We'll, we'll put some pictures on the screen now, but that's a good film if you want to go check it out. Right, awesome. Um, yeah, the, I think I think that, uh, well, uh, God, there's so many things I'd love to pick your brain about. Because, I mean, we could be here all day because I, I, I want to talk about like Mach-E Mustang and, you know, there's a million things I want to chat about. But I think maybe maybe we wrap it up. Your What is your perception of the South African car market in in terms of passenger vehicles i mean so so you're obviously a manufacturer who is playing in the in the bucky space which is a hugely important space um where do you see the market going do you, do you think sedans are dead do you think it's all going to be suvs and how, do, how does ford fit into that how does your strategy fit into yeah. that really good question and i think that there's mm. there's there's a whole multitude of different moving pieces in there. Mm. Um, you know, so if I take the industry as a whole, South Africa has a very unique challenge, um, different to other parts of the world, um, in the sense that affordability is an absolutely crucial thing. And you know, if you look at the um, penetration, if I can call it that, of Indian sourced vehicles that are coming into South Africa, and, and there's nothing wrong with the quality of those vehicles because you know they've got a massive manufacturing operation there. So that's serving a need, and it's really doing a great job at providing affordable vehicles for people to buy in South Africa. And those tend to be your hatchbacks, your smaller sedan-sized vehicles. The, the global trends are definitely moving more towards SUVs. And I think that that ultimately is going to start shaping what our profile of vehicles in South Africa will look like. And I think it's based on availability, some of those trends that we're seeing happening in other markets. From a Ford Motor Company perspective, we, we took the call that we see the future moving into SUVs and into commercial vehicles. Um, and as a consequence of that, we started retiring some of our you know traditional sedan vehicles. Um, and we're gonna see those being phased out and ultimately replaced by a whole suite of SUVs that will fulfill the same role, um, but do it in a different lifestyle sort of connotation for customers. So that's kind of the trend that we see happening. And then of course, you've got the other curveball for me, which is the whole new energy vehicles in terms of where that's gonna go and, and what's gonna happen in that particular space. And I think people tend to always go, well, electric, electric vehicles won't work in South Africa because of ESKIM. Mm. ESKIM's gonna get fixed one way or the other. It's either gonna be you know private power producers um, or Eskom will get sorted, but electric vehicles are going to become a future of our of our car um, portfolio. And that's I, good to hear. I got to say, I'm I'm super excited by what you know I'm seeing and reading about electric vehicles. Not only ours, but also other other manufacturers. And there's there's some amazing things. And you mean you mentioned the Mustang Mark E. Mm. You know, just an absolutely sensational vehicle that mm. does things completely different. And, you know, range anxiety is the thing of the past. I mean, that vehicle's got a standard range of 500 kilometers. Sheesh. Yeah. So, you know, there, there's a whole multitude of different things that can happen in that yeah. direction. But you're right. We can talk for, we can talk for hours. <laughs> I know. There, oh, there's so many things. Well, I think, I mean, we'll have to have you back on. I'd love to be back. You know, the, the, oh, there's so many things to chat about. Um, but I, th I think let's, uh, let's perhaps wrap it up there. It's been a hell of a lot of fun. Thank you, sir. Well, no, I can't call you that. Thank you, Neil. <laughs> sure, my absolute pleasure. Really good to come down here and spend time with you guys. I'm glad that we could get this to work, and I, I look forward to coming back. Ah, no, you, you're very, very welcome. I'd, I'd love, we, can, we can do this next week if you want. Well, thanks very much. Thanks very much to our audience for watching or listening. You can find our podcasts on one of the 7,000 podcast platforms that are out there that you probably use. Of course, you can watch all our podcasts on YouTube. This has been episode six. I encourage you to dig into our YouTube channel. Go and check out all our Ford content. There's Mustangs in there, Bullets. There's, there's Ranger. There's me absolutely beeping myself in a in a raptor jumping in the dunes so go and check that out we'll put all those links in the descriptions below thanks very much for watching be safe be strong out there we'll catch you soon all right ciao ciao cars at Coza is so much more than just a youtube channel take our app for instance it's been downloaded over 500,000 times in the android store alone which means it must be okay right you'll find the links to the download for ios and android in the description below